Okay. Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Welcome everybody who's joining us online uh, via Facebook. We are <sighs> glad you're joining us here for this Palm Sunday. Uh, we're coming live from uh, Homestead Assisted Living Facility, which we do once a month. We love being here. Pray with me, if you will. Father God, thank you, Lord, so much for your son, Jesus. We praise his name this morning. We praise you, Lord, for all that you are. You are good. You are holy. You are mighty. You are just. You are God. Thank you, Lord. Be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dr. Harold Bryson, he tells a story of two boys who went to their pastor to request advice on what they could do to help people. And the pastor told them of a blind man who would love to have someone come and read the Bible to him. The man was delighted when the boys came and told him of their plan. Where do you want us to begin, they asked. Well, he said, since you will be coming back each week, let's start with Matthew and read through the New Testament. So the boys began their reading, and as you recall, the first chapter of Matthew is a genealogy. It's full of begats. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. And, -so and the, boys, the boys began their reading. And they say, let's skip this list of names. That's what they suggested. Let's skip this list of names. And, and the old man, he says, no, read them all. Read them all. It was an effort because some of those names are hard to pronounce. But they plowed through the list the best they could, these two young boys. And when they finished, they noticed tears coming down the blind man's cheeks. What is so emotional, emotional about a list of names, one of the boys asked. The blind man said, God knew every one of those fellows, and he knew them by name. Boys, that makes me feel important to know that God knows me, and he knows me by my name as well. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12 through 13 says, or sorry, verse uh, uh, 13 and 14 says, Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? What we read about this, these, these rhetorical questions here in Isaiah, what we read about is a picture of what's known as God's omniscience. This means God is all-knowing. It means God knows everything that has happened. He knows everything that will happen. He knows everything that is happening in the present. And because he is omnipresent, we talked about that last week, he's everywhere all at once. He knows everything about everything in every place. Nothing is hidden from God. I want to dig, dig a little bit deeper here because the passage that we read earlier, this Isaiah passage, the context of it is the people are facing exile in Babylon. And God is offering them comfort by revisiting the nature of himself as creator. And thereby showing his power to fulfill his promises to them. There's a guy named J. Alec Moitier, and he points out that in Babylonian mythology, the creator god Marduk... Um, he could not proceed with creation without consulting another god, this Ea, the all-wise one. But see, the Lord doesn't work that way. He doesn't need any help. He created with unaided wisdom. See, our God needs no other counsel. He needs no other God to help him. He needs no other knowledge to create. He is Yahweh, the self-existing one. Amen. Now understanding this, we have to realize a few things about the knowledge of this self-existing one, this all-knowing God. And the fact that he is holy, he is set apart, that he is the creator, and he alone is omniscient. Meaning that he knows all that has happened in the past. Why? He was there. Makes sense, right? 
Job chapter 37. I'm going to move out of the way here. Do you know how the clouds hang poised, those wonders of him who has perfect knowledge? How are the clouds hung? Because God created them. He knows all that has happened because he was there for creation. Why? Because he was the one doing the creating. So he knows everything that has happened in the past. That means he knows everything, all about everything in your life. But he also knows everything that is happening in the moment. A couple more verses for you here. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and now, and from now on you will be at war. This is from 2 Chronicles 16.9. The point I don't want you to miss is the fact that he sees everything. It rains throughout the earth. His eyes range throughout the, the earth. And he strengthens those who are committed. In Job chapter 28, it says, For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. He knows everything that is happening in the moment. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in creation, in all, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So God knows everything that has happened. He knows everything that is happening. And not only does he know those things, being omniscient means he knows everything that will happen. He knows everything that will happen. He knows the future and what it all holds. Isaiah 46 says this. It says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. So from the very beginning, he knew what's still to come. He knows everything that will happen. I said, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. One of the things that's really interesting, especially about this time of year, when we're talking about God knowing everything uh, that will happen, one of the things that we read about throughout the Bible is prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. Today is Palm Sunday. There was prophecy about how there would be a, uh, the Messiah would come riding a donkey into Jerusalem. That's in back of Zechariah, I believe it is. And there's prophecy of, of all throughout uh, the, the Bible about the coming of the Messiah pointing ahead and this prophecy was fulfilled through Jesus Christ whom we celebrate every day hopefully <laughs> but we celebrate his resurrection next Sunday and his triumphal entry this Sunday so that tells us that God knows everything that is going to happen and everything that he says is going to happen will come to fruition but see, there's one other interesting aspect about God's omniscience that I need to actually just point out. Because not only does God know all that has happened in the past, and all that is happening in the present, as well as all that will happen in the future, God knows everything that could happen. He knows everything that is, could, could happen, which means he knows every possible outcome of anything. He knows it all. Now, this is something theologically is called Molinism or, or middle knowledge or something like that. And I'm only going to touch on it briefly because what it does, at least for a simple man like myself, it helps me to wrap my head around the idea of those who have never been presented the gospel, those who have never heard a word of Jesus, what, what fate uh, uh, awaits them in the future? Well, if God knows everything that could happen, he knows how people would respond to the gospel. And the gospel will be made available to them when they are ready to hear it. And I have to trust that that is God's word. Now that's a simple man. Uh, that's how I wrap, wrap my head around those things. I don't want to get too deep into this theological debate or conversation about that. But the idea is he knows everything. He knows everything. Now, this is all very well and good. It's all very well and good. And as you can see, each aspect of God's omniscience help us to understand who God is. And how he operates within our lives. But there is a consequence to all of this knowing. There always is a consequence. Good consequences, bad consequences. But there's always consequences. And he, at least to us as believers for sure. And the fact is this. God knows everything that will happen. Everything that is happening. Everything that has happened. And everything that could happen. But he knows us. 
intimately. He knows not just our names. He knows everything about us. He knows our thoughts. Psalm chapter 139, 1 through 2 says, I have, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. And you know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. He knows our thoughts. He also knows our cares, our anxieties, our worries. Psalm 139, 23, the same passage. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now that last part is interesting. See if there's any offensive way in me. Because he knows our thoughts. He knows our worries and our cares. He, he knows our hearts. And he knows that our hearts are stained by sin. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So he knows us. He knows that our hearts are stained by sin. He knows our sin and he knows what it would take for us to be forgiven of those sins. Which is why Jesus came, right? I like the way Arthur Pink puts it. He says this. How solemn is this fact? Nothing can be concealed from God. Though he be invisible to us, we are not so to him. Neither the darkness of night, the closest of curtains, nor the deepest dungeon can hide any sinner from the eyes of omniscience. The trees of the garden were not able to conceal our first parents. No human eye beheld Cain murder his brother, but his maker witnessed his crime. Sarah might laugh derisively in the seclusion of her tent, yet it was heard by Jehovah. Achan stole a wedge of gold and carefully hid it in the earth, but God brought it to light. David was at much pains to try to cover up his wickedness with Bathsheba and all that mess. But long, ere long the all-seeing God who sent one of his servants to say to him, Thou art the man. Some find the omniscience of God troublesome for this very reason. Because we don't like to have our sins exposed. He knows the innermost soul of the individuals, each of us, our thoughts, our desires, our lusts, our fears, our apprehensions, our worries. And for some people, that's just too much to bear. Because Why? Because they wish to remain secluded, private, and autonomous. But they can't. But to the believer... This omniscience of God should be a great comfort. It should be a great comfort because God knows our sins and loves us despite them. I love that. I love that because I screw it up all the time. And the fact that God still loves me, that's a blessing. <laughs> because otherwise I'd be in trouble. To the believer, this is a great comfort because he knows our transgressions and he loves us enough to judge us for them, to discipline us and correct us. And he knows our worries and our anxiety and he gives us peace. He knows our pains and he gives us comfort. He knows our future. And he knows that our future resides with Jesus. Worshipping him and basking in his glory. And he knows our name. Because if we are a believer, that name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The disciples said that Jesus, to, to Jesus himself, that his omniscience was the very reason they came to believe that he came from God. What a great thing is God's omniscience. That he knows us. The goods, the bads, the uglies, the ins, the outs. And loves us still. The omniscience of God is a great comfort to those who know him. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you are all-knowing. 
The word says that you know the number of hairs on our head. You know us so intimately we can't even fathom it. You know where we fail. You know our hearts, goods and bads. We thank you that you love us anyway and that you sent Jesus to die for us, to redeem us. Thank you, Lord. That's why we sing our praises today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. amen. Yes. So we're going to close with one more. I put that in there like that. I think that goes there. And sorry, I got to adjust all this. All right. So let's close with Hosanna because, hey. Oh, 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 oh,